Welcome to our fifth talk in the Tombs of the Isles talk series about rock art in the home of Papawashi South Tomb with Dr. Antonia Thomas. If you'd like to find out more, please visit our website at archaeologyorkney.com slash tombs of the isles. In this final talk of three, uh, looking at passage grave art in the North Isles tombs in Orkney as part of the Tombs of the Isles project, I'm going to be focusing on one site in particular. I'm going to be presenting a case study about the carvings in the home of Papa Westry South Chambered Cairn, Papa Westry. And just to show you where it is. And over the last few years, I've been involved in a Historic Environment Scotland funded project which involved a multi-layered approach to look at the rock art in this unique cairn. I used a combination of analogue and digital research methods using documentary and photographic archives, raking light survey and photogrammetry to produce the most detailed account that's so far been possible for this site. So in this case study, I'm going to look at one aspect of the cairn in particular, its unique rock art, and talk about some of the new discoveries that we've found in our survey work. The tomb itself is still very prominent today. It's huge. It occupies the highest point at the south of the home of Pappy and is one of, the, one of many surviving Neolithic passage graves in Orkney, but is one of the biggest. It's nearly 40 metres long externally. It's also one of the few sites which contains extant internal carvings and the only surviving funerary site in Orkney with peck decoration. Today, you can visit the site yourself, courtesy of the Pappy Development Trust, by taking a small boat across to the home and descending through a hatch in the roof and down a metal ladder into the 13.5 metres long corridor-like central chamber. The walls survived to a height of up to 2.6 metres in places, but nowadays the tomb is protected from the elements with a concrete roof. But what do we know about its earlier history? Our first records of the site come from FWL Thomas, captain of the cutter Woodlark, who was surveying in Orkney for the Royal Navy. He was invited by Thomas Trail of Holland House to investigate a so-called Pick's House on the home. The roof of the main chamber had already fallen in by then, although his records state that this had only apparently happened within living memory. Thomas cleared out most of the structure down to a clean clay floor, covered with windblown sand, but only found a few rabbit and sheep bones. He made some very nice elevation and plan drawings of the site, and crucially for us, he noted two possible decorated stones. A neatly engraved circle about four inches in diameter, and another stone with the appearance of having two small circles touching each other engraved upon it. Now, of course, this got the other antiquarians of the day interested, and George Petrie visited a few years later. Petrie was agreeably surprised not only to find the circles referred to by Lieutenant Thomas, but also discover, quite close to them, as well as on various other stones in the walls, other engraved figures. He published the drawings of four of these in 1857, but the location of the first one shown on the top left is not clear, beyond being on the east side of the main or centre apartment. A few years later, he published another illustrated account of the site, but this time the number one from his uh, last figure is not reproduced, although a striking zigzag is. Importantly, however, in this publication, he makes the connection between these carvings and those in the chambered cairns of Newgrange and Douth in Ireland which is pretty good going, so he recognised that connection between those megalithic sites in Ireland and those in Orkney. And it was Petrie, of course, who recognised the site for what it was. Not a pick's house, but a chambered cairn. In addition to his published drawings, however, there is a set of unpublished sketches of the rock art in the tomb by Petrie. These are interesting because they show a few differences from the published examples. They were made earlier and suggest that by the time Petrie came to publish his account, he had perhaps revised his opinion of some of the marks. 
And so we see the mysterious, almost spectacle-like motif on the top right, and also some other markings. It seems likely that the one on the top left in this picture is natural, but the one below it is intriguing with its chevron and potential eyebrow motif. It seems though that Petrie, Trail, Thomas and all the others then lost interest in the site because nothing very much is written about it again for rather a long time. The cairn fell into ruin very rapidly after these initial investigations and by the time Joseph Anderson visit, visited the site in 1872 it was described as much dilapidated. Its deterioration would continue well into the next century. By 1924, according to Hugh Marwick, it was in a deplorable state of collapse. The site was then visited by John Maitland Corrie of the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland in 1928 and described in detail in his field notebooks. He noted that the interior is partially filled up and littered with debris that obscures a great part of the detailed structure. You can see from this level of rubble infill and debris in the Royal Commission photo from around the same time. It is just one of a collection of photographs taken by the Commission in 1929, before the site was taken into state guardianship. These photographs offer us a fantastic resource. One of the important things to consider, of course, when doing this sort of survey, is to what extent the building reflects its Neolithic form, what is original and what has been reconstructed. So these photos by the Royal Commission in the 1920s are really, really important for us. Nowadays, the roof is supported on concrete walls, which are slightly set back from and rising above the original walls but it is difficult to know sometimes the extent of other restoration works. Comparisons between these images and the extant stonework now suggest that reconstruction was only minimal. This photo of the southwestern end of the interior is taken from the same position, one in 1929 and one in 2018. And you can see the upper course of stonework is largely the same, but, there are still a few mysteries. The Royal Commission visited the site again in 1935, after the consolidation works, and they published these lovely drawings of the carved stones. But what is perhaps more interesting here is not um, what they don't show, presumably markings which have been lost or worn away, or for some reason were no longer visible, but what they do show because their illustration shows, for the first time, this carving on the top left, which looks, to those familiar with the Nessa Brodga assemblage that I mentioned in previous talks, something like a Brodga butterfly. And this presents a bit of a mystery. Because if we look at Petrie's drawings again, that stone with the kind of Brodga butterfly-like pet symbol doesn't appear on any of his drawings. But the zigzag stone does, and you can see it here on the bottom left. But in the tomb, the butterfly stone is right next to the zigzag stone in a very prominent position with highly visible carvings. It seems highly unlikely that Petrie would have missed this stone. So for me, I think this suggests that the stone may not be in its original position. The motif and technique of execution certainly look genuinely, genuine enough as a piece of Neolithic rock art. But it's possible that the stone itself was actually found amongst the rubble during the reconstruction and placed in its current location. But we can see here it's quite loose and in the top course of walling. And there's perhaps something quite funny going on with this lintel as well. Perhaps the most famous stone from within the tomb. It's well known for its eyebrow carvings shown on the right, the kind of like arcing uh, uh, carvings over the dots that look like eyes and eyebrows. But the markings on the left hand of the stone look rather different to those shown on Petrie's drawings as well. Because if we look at the Royal Commission drawings again, 
the ones taken in 1935, published in 1946, there are what look rather like two initials, possibly EO or EB, at the left-hand side of that carving. And although the top lines of these were certainly shown by Petrie, I wonder whether the letters were added after the cairn was exposed, as by the time of the Royal Commission visit in 1929, they noted that the carved lintel contains, in addition, two characters resembling an E and an O, marks which weren't there before. And here you can see, on Petrie's unpublished drawings from 1853, how the lintel was represented by him. We see the tops, the curving lines on the tops of uh, those, that, those letters, the E and the B or the E and the O, but certainly not the letters underneath. Is it possible that these are more recent graffiti which were added to the Neolithic rock art? Perhaps we'll never know. In the late 1970s, Elizabeth Sheetwoig visited the site and recorded five decorated stones, including one that had not been noted previously, labelled E on this figure and comprising a line of shallow cut marks. But by this time, many of the carvings which were first noted in the 1850s were thought to have been lost forever. Sheetwoig visited the tomb as part of her epic survey of megalithic art and passage grave art in northwest Europe. And it's interesting to look at these marks within the Homer Papa Westry South Cairn in relation to that much wider corpus of material. You'll see as well that there's um, a stone D as well on this um, illustration by Sheetoig, and also the fact that the letters are there on the lintel, um, but she's recorded them as looking rather more like a T P than an E and a B. So the home of Papa Westry South Cairn has had a rich history of investigation from the 1850s onwards. And there's been many mysteries about the carvings and how they are represented or not, whether they've been lost or not, and it would certainly seem to be ripe for reinvestigation of the site. Added to that, over the last few years, our knowledge of rock art in Orkney and passage grave art in particular has expanded hugely with all the work that's gone on at the Nessa Brogga and my survey work at other sites, including Mays Howe and Scarra Bray. So with all of this in mind, it seemed timely to revisit the famous carvings within the Homer Pappy tomb. In 2016, a programme of detailed photogrammetry work on the structure of the tomb was commissioned by Historic Environment Scotland and undertaken by Hugo Anderson Weimark. Around the same time, I was funded to undertake a detailed study of the site's rock art. Our combined survey work allowed a layered approach to research and analysis, using both digital and analogue methods alongside detailed archival study. I undertook my fieldwork in 2018 in the form of a raking light survey, examining in detail each stone within the tomb, photographing and drawing these in my notebook, and comparing the extant stonework with both the 3D model produced by Hugo and the archive photographs taken in the 1920s. One of the many great things about having a detailed photogrammetry survey is that it allows the production of high resolution measured and scaled ortho photos of the plan and internal elevations of the site. Hugo generated scaled and levelled elevation photos of the whole tomb from his 2006 survey. I was able to use these as the base drawings for my work, allowing me to mark on the position of decorated stones and other features of interest in my survey, as shown in these elevations. I then digitised these ortho photos to produce detailed line drawings and create for the first time a really accurate measured record of both the internal stonework and the decoration in the tomb. I did this for the whole of the interior, which involved drawing quite a lot of stones. And here's the drawings of all the features I recorded during the survey. 
You might recognise some of the more well-known examples, but you can also see there's quite a few more than have been shown previously. So how do these compare to the antiquarian and other records? And how do they compare to other examples of Neolithic carvings known in Orkney? Well, looking at them all together, they're actually quite a strange mixed bag of markings. Angular designs, such as these inverted chevrons, but also faint curvilinear marks. Whether some of these are um, represent the missing examples first represented by Petrie is hard to know. Perhaps his most enigmatic example, the one shown on the bottom right, might have disappeared. It, it's one of its nearest comparisons on the bottom left here was also shown by Petrie. So it's not this one. And his faint eyebrow design and zigzag shown on the top left here doesn't quite seem to exist either. On the top right, sorry, that picture. But when I was back in the tomb last summer, I happened to notice another stone that I hadn't recorded in my 2018 survey. This one, shown on the bottom. And although it's clearly been broken, the face is quite damaged, I think this is actually a good candidate for the missing stone of Petrie's that I couldn't find before. It certainly illustrates how difficult it is to see some of these carvings when the site has been so weathered through time. And often, without appropriate lighting, it is almost impossible to see some of these carvings. It also demonstrates that it's always worth having another good look, even at tombs and other sites that you think have been recorded again and again and again, because there can often be new things to find. When we did our survey work, we also realised that there were other faint traces of decoration that survive and that hadn't been recorded before. This example here, comprising a circular motif and nested chevrons, is an unusual example which combines angular and curvilinear styles. It doesn't look quite like any of the other ones that have Petrie recorded, yet its position in the middle of the wall means that it's certainly in its original position. The assemblage is surprisingly dominated by circular motifs, both small individual cut marks or lines or groups of cut marks or larger pecked and smooth circles. The trouble is, not all of these are what they first appear to be. This example at the bottom, for example, is for, was first identified by Thomas in the 19th century, yet he didn't seem to be entirely convinced about it being a deliberate mark at all. And he said, there is a neatly engraved circle about four inches in diameter, but perhaps this is actually a natural mark. These sorts of circles seem to appear throughout the tomb, and it seems that much of the stone in the cairn is prone to this sort of circular spalling caused by the differential weathering of spherical concretions within the sandstone. Natural circles and cut marks appear throughout. But what is really interesting about these examples of natural rock art is that they seem to have been considered important by the builders of the tomb. They appear within the same positions as the deliberate carvings, at the same sort of height and placement, suggesting that they were deliberately selected for inclusion in the building. Certainly the peculiarities of the natural stone seem to lend themselves to cut marks and eyebrows, with ripples and small circular hollows common throughout. It's possible that this explains some of Petrie's earlier drawings, which may have been simple overinterpretations of natural marks. So what does this tell us about the other eyebrow motifs that the tomb is famous for? Well, they're certainly real, and here are two of the most well-known examples of stones from the tomb, and these have been discussed since the 19th century. These are definitely human-made marks. And that's not it. The motifs at the home of Papa Westry also bear a resemblance to the Westry Wifey, or Orkney Venus figurine, from the excavations at the links of Nortland in Westry. Both sites have also produced stones with eyebrow motifs, suggesting a significance to this motif and form of decoration that extends into both domestic and funerary spheres of architecture. 
They're also similar to uh, designs found on other artefacts from across Britain in the Neolithic, such as the famous Folkton drums, and closer to home, the Scarabray Buddo. During the survey, we also found new examples of previously unrecorded eyebrow or spectacled motifs, such as this example, which has two cut marks with faint eyebrows over, weathered and hard to see, but undoubtedly deliberate. And this example as well in the northeast end compartment. Again, two very faintly pecked cut marks encircled by spectacles or eyebrows. Nowadays, this is incredibly faint, the surface of the stone weathered almost smooth. But in the Neolithic, this stone was clearly meant to be seen. It was placed into the corner wall at an angle which would have made it as visible as possible. It would have caught the light as you entered that end of the cell. No wonder the stone is weathered now though. You can see on this 1929 photograph that it's just visible. This southwest facing stone appears to have just been sat just above the rubble fill that protected lower lying stones. It would have been open to the elements for at least 80 years. I wonder how many other bespectacled eyes or eyebrow motifs once stared out from these wall faces only to have been worn away by years and years of wind and rain. The predominance of these types of markings which look to, to us like eyebrows and spectacles, etc., in the tomb is certainly unusual compared to other Neolithic sites in Orkney. And the home of Papi South clearly has its own distinctive repertoire of motifs. We can think of all these different tombs as having their own personality, being very deliberately having their own sense of decoration and internal appearance. There are similarities, commonalities across the different passage graves, but each one is also individual. I think it's highly significant that many of the stones have natural cut marks and eyebrows on them, geological markings rather than human-made ones, with ripples and small circular hollows caused by geological action. But that these stones, even though they had natural markings, appear to have been deliberately chosen and placed in significant settings within the tomb alongside those with deliberate markings. I think this tells us a lot about the identity, rooted perhaps in geology and the landscape, that the builders of these tombs had. We can see this in other stones, that, such as this one. Because the interpretation of markings as either natural or human made can be distorted. Whilst the two cut marks or hollows on the face of this stone are natural, there appears to be deliberate pecking underneath the left hand one in this picture, which respects the circular marks. But like the butterfly stone I mentioned earlier, which sits suspiciously loose on the top course of walling, I wonder if this stone has also been placed there during the reconstruction original but just not in its original position and perhaps placed there during consolidation in the 1920s. In fact I, I think this stone might just be upside down because if you look at it like this it actually looks very similar to a kind of spectacled um, eye motif that we've seen in some of the other stones. And this blurring of the natural and the human made seems to be a characteristic of Neolithic and Neolithic rock art in Orkney. And it's worth noting, um, as I said in my, one of my previous talks, that the Nessa Brogga and other sites, we also see stones with natural markings taken to the site and placed in the same way as deliberately carved motifs. So, and that kind of brings me to the end of today's talk.
I hope you've enjoyed listening to this case study about the rock art in the home of Papa Westry South tomb. You can read more about the survey work and the rock art in the tomb in a report I produced for Historic Environment Scotland, which is available on the Tombs of the Isles website. And perhaps if you come to Orkney, you might be able to take a trip across to the home yourself and see them in person. Thanks for listening.